Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm just copying you there, Caroline. You just posted a nice message in the chat. Um, welcome to today's Shah mini masterclass. Um, I can see from the list, I think there's at least one or two people who've come along to um, previous uh, sessions like this that we've been running over the last year. Um, but this is the one, the first one of our, our 2021 to 2022 academic year, so to speak. So uh, Nikki, our speaker today, is, is kicking off the latest series of the, the Shah Mini Masterclasses. Um, thanks to you all for finding the time to join us today. Um, could somebody just let me know in the chat that you can definitely hear me before I carry on with the more detailed instructions? Great, thank you. Lots of you can say you can hear me. That's brilliant. OK, before we get started, I'm just going to explain a little bit about the sort of practicalities of, of using Blackboard Collaborate for um, those of you that haven't maybe come to one of these webinars before and might not be so familiar with it. Um, so basically, there's just a few little sort of icons that you need to be aware of. Um, and for most of you, those are going to be at the bottom of your screen, but it does depend what kind of device you've joined us on. If you're on a tablet or a phone, they might be at the, at the top or to the side of the screen. Um, but basically, um, the main thing that you probably need to know about today is the chat box. So the way that you access the chat box is that you click the little purple tab in the bottom right hand corner of your screen. Uh, and then a menu will pop out at the side if you haven't seen it already. And then if you click on the speech bubble, that will open up the chat box. And probably lots of you can see already that there's been a few messages posted there. The chat box is generally what we use to take your questions. So we take questions at the end of the session. Um, but if you want to post questions during the session, that is absolutely fine. Um, I'll kind of act as moderator and I'll put all the questions to the speaker at the end of the session. Um, I can see that Luke's just put a poll up asking if anybody's been to a masterclass before. I've got quite a few yeses there. I thought I recognised the names. Um, there is also the settings cog in that little menu that jumps out from the side. If you click on that, it does give you the option of checking your audio and video settings. Um, so if you're having any trouble hearing us or anything, you can go into there and just check that the right audio device, video device, whatever, is being used by Collaborate. Then the other things that you really need to be aware of are if you do want to ask a question in person, um, obviously we'd ask you to wait till the to the end of the the, uh, the speakers when they finish to do that. Um, but you can click on the microphone icon to activate your microphone if you want to ask a question in person. And similarly, if you want to, you can activate your video as well by clicking on the little camera icon. Um, if you need to get our attention for any reason, particularly if you if you need a bit of help with um, any kind of issues you're having in terms of hearing or whatever, um, if you click the little raise hand, the little person with their hand up, what we'll probably do is contact you via the chat. We can do um, sort of private one to one chats with people in the background. So we'll probably contact you that way to ask what it, you know, what it is you need help with and see if there's any way that we can help you. So that's the basics of how we're going to sort of run the session today. And if you do post a question in the chat, um, which we very much like you to do, um, just make sure that you put a queue in front of it and then your question. Um, because what we tend to find um, is that people also kind of post just comments and observations during the session in the chat as well, which again is really, really uh, useful and interesting for, uh, for us and for the other attendees. Um, but it just makes my job as a moderator a little bit easier at the end of the session if I can clearly pick out the, the, the items within the chat thread that are definitely questions that you want me to, to put to our, our speaker today. OK, so if you can put Q in front of your question, then type your question. That would be very much appreciated. So uh, just a few uh, messages before we start. Um, uh, Nikki is a personal tutor uh, for us on quite a range of our programmes in Shah. Um, we've just started our new academic year, obviously, so our new uh, students arrived uh, in Sheffield and at Shah a couple of weeks ago. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about, in particular, our, our MPH or Master in Public Health programme or our MPH specialist programme in clinical research, um, the links are on the screen, but I'll post those in the, in the chat in a little bit. We also have um, a number of short courses upcoming in Shah. Again, I'll put the link in the chat. Um, but the ones that we're running up till Christmas um, or to the end of uh, this year uh, are all going to be run online. So you can see we've got courses 
on a range of subjects, short courses on uh, mixed methods approaches to evidence research, um, a course about critical appraisal, um, our extremely popular systematic reviews and meta-analysis course, um, Andy Tattersall, who's uh, uh, with us today, who organises the, the Sharmini Masterclasses, um, his uh, introduction to social media to communicate research is coming up as well. Um, so we've got quite a few courses coming up between now and the end of the year, and they're all online, so they're obviously very convenient to attend. You can find out more about those at the link, and again, I'll post that in the chat in a moment. And also just to let you know about uh, Shah's relatively new uh, podcast series called Communicable Research. Um, I think we're up to episode four now, and I think episode five will be coming out fairly soon, although Andy can probably put in the chat when the next one's going to be uh, released. Um, but we have now four episodes of our Communicable Research podcast. So this is a, a new podcast series where um, Andy Tattersall um, reaches out uh, to members of staff, research staff in our department um, to ask them to participate in a conversation about the, the research and the research area that they work within. So the latest one is with uh, Dr. Chris Blackmore, who works in the area of mental health, but there are three other episodes there. So if you're interested, I've given the link to Spotify, and again, I'll, I'll paste all this in the chat in a moment. Um, but you can, if you just search for, I think if you probably just search for Shah in um, Apple Podcasts, Android Podcasts, Podomatic, any podcasting app or Spotify, you should be able to uh, find it. And then the next couple of sessions we've got in the Masterclass series between now and the end of 2021 um, are the uh, next one is going to be with Dr. Liz Such, um, so that'll be coming up in November, and that's about a public health approach to modern slavery and human trafficking. Uh, so you can book at the link there. Again, I'll put it in the in the chat. And then uh, the last one of 2021 uh, is going to be with Professor John Holmes, who some of you may well be familiar with. Um, he is actually one of the guests on the podcast series uh, that uh, I just mentioned. I think he's episode two, John Holmes. Um, but his mini masterclass is going to be about um, his beloved topic of uh, alcohol pricing, uh, and particularly looking uh, at um, sort of putting that research into, into practice uh, and reforming uh, alcohol pricing. So those are the two coming up, both free to book in November and December of this year. But today uh, we're joined by Nikki Totten, who's going to be talking about evaluating the trade off between benefits and risks in treatment decisions. Uh, Nikki completed a BSc and an MSc at the University of West of England at Bristol, uh, and then went on to work as a trial statistician at Bangor University, part of the University of Wales. She's currently at Shah, an ESRC doctoral fellow, and she's looking at the potential of uh, benefit risk methods to be used in publicly funded clinical trials. She's also an advisor with the Yorkshire and Humber Research Design Service. Uh, she advises generally on quantitative research and quantitative methods, but also specifically on statistical issues such as analysis and sample size calculations. Uh, she's a member of the Royal Statistical Society. And as I said, she acts as a personal tutor to students across our postgraduate programmes, both our campus based programmes and our online uh, postgraduate talk programmes. So I'm just going to switch over to Nikki's slides. Just bear with me a moment. OK, so now I'll hand over to you, Nikki. Brilliant. Thanks, Claire. Just check you can hear me OK. Yes, brilliant. Thanks, Emma. Um, OK, so thanks for that introduction, Claire. As, as she said, I, um, after working in Shah for a few years, I'm now on an ESRC doctoral fellowship, um, but still um, within Shah in the University of Sheffield. And so today I'm going to be talking about how we could think about evaluating the trade offs between benefits and risks when we're making treatment decisions. So just to start off with a few acknowledgements, um, firstly, obviously, the funders. So the work I'm going to be talking about today comes from two different projects. Um, one was funded by the Medical Research Council. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, and then the other half comes from my doctoral work funded by the ESRC. And then in the box, there's just some thanks and acknowledgements for people who have put in a lot of time and effort to help me with the work I'm presenting today. I'm very grateful for all of their input. 
So in this session, I'm going to be splitting it into um, roughly two parts. So the first half um, is going to be more um, the background. And we'll be talking about what is benefit risk and why I think it's important and how we might be able to use these methods within research. And particularly, I'm going to be noting just some of the considerations we need to be making when we're doing this. And then the second half is going to be a little bit more practical, so um, give examples of some of the methods and, and talk through them briefly, as well as tips on how to use benefit risk, particularly in clinical trials, and how we might be able to do that moving forward. So starting off, what is benefit risk? And um, so all treatments have both benefits and risks, and it's really important that we're able to assess the balance to make sure that the benefits outweigh the risk. This is really commonly done in regulatory settings, um, and it's a, that's supported by this quote I've put here by the FDA, who are the main regulator in, in the United States, who say not only must the drug be effective, but its expected benefits must outweigh its potential risks to patients. And so as an example of that, um, I've taken this uh, paper that was looking at a drug called Ticagrelor, and it was recently evaluated for patients with coronary artery disease. Um, and they had the expected benefits were a reduction in cardiovascular death, a um, reduction in myocardial infarction, and a redu reduction in ischemic stroke. But there was the additional risk of bleeds, um, both major and fatal, and also intracranial hemorrhage. So the regulators then had to decide, does this reduction in risk of cardiovascular death, which is the, was the primary outcome, worth the potential increase in risk of bleeds for patients? Um, so this drug was ultimately approved and the benefit risk trade-off was deemed acceptable. But I'm actually going to come back to this example later as it wasn't just a straightforward decision. And um, so we'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. But I also wanted to mention that it's not just one treatment that we could be looking at um, where we're evaluating do the benefits of this treatment outweigh its risks. We might be also looking at multiple outcomes, multiple treatments. Um, so they might have, in their own right, have been deemed to have a, a positive benefit risk trade-off, but we might then need to know, well, which one is more beneficial? And so this can require taking into account more than one outcome. So given this example with treatment A and treatment B, I've just used three outcomes here. If we just looked at stroke, it might be that treatment A looked better. If we just looked at bleeds, it might be that treatment B looked better. So it's important to be able to include multiple outcomes and compare them comparably between two treatments. So I'm sure we've all heard a lot about COVID-19 recently, but I just wanted to touch on this because benefit risk has become so prevalent in the discussions um, since we've been talking about COVID-19. And this has come in a lot of different ways, but particularly we've when we're talking about the lockdown restrictions and decisions, when people have been talking about vaccines and also the treatments for benefit risks. So I'm just going to give a couple of quick examples as to how these have, the wording and the terminology has become quite prevalent. So here I've taken three um, example um, articles that were written um, all around the AstraZeneca vaccine. And as you can see, especially for the two on the, the left, the terminology of benefits outweighing risks were really important in um, the publications. And these, these range from, you know, there's the BMJ at the top. And then on the right here, we've got an article, this is actually taken from a BBC article, so it's meant for the public. And the idea of, of the infographic that they did here was to make the metrics comparable um, to aid understanding for the patients and the public of the outcomes we were discussing about the vaccine. And that's really key in the idea of benefit risk is being able to make outcomes comparable. So there was also a lot of benefit risk decisions um, due to the regulatory nature um, for the treatment. So this is a summary table, which is one of the key benefit risk methods that I'll talk about later. Um, but this was completed for one of the um, potential treatments where they clearly um, outlined the benefits and the risks for the treatment compared to um, the comparator, which was, was placebo, um, to be able to evaluate whether it, it would be worthwhile and there was a positive benefit risk balance for treating COVID for this drug, which there was and it, it was used in practice. And the final example I wanted to give was um, actually some people did some work about whether research during COVID had a positive benefit risk balance. So obviously in the height of the pandemic, if you're completing face-to-face -face research, that's 
potentially increasing transmission, um, which could be a problem. But also if we then just cancelled all of the research, that would be um, a problem as well. So they created this um, table to be able to evaluate whether it was worthwhile if there was a positive benefit risk balance for continuing with research um, during the COVID-19 pandemic. So hopefully that's given an idea of why I think um, benefit risk is important and particularly in the current scenario, um, a few different uses of it. Um, but part of our project was to look at what are the rationales for using benefit risk in research. And we found these six different um, points that, from the work that we did. And so the first one of these is the success of a treatment is dependent on more than one outcome. And so this was really important in the example I gave before, where the, the treatment made one thing better, but potentially made other things worse. And so actually, we, we really need to be looking at more than one outcome. And that comes into the second point on, on this slide, which is important outcomes are in competing directions. So by that, I mean one is getting better by the treatment and, one, and it's another outcomes made worse by the treatment. And the idea to be able to trade those off is important. So patient preference can be um, included in benefit risk research, which I haven't mentioned yet, but it's a real strength of these methods is that you can use patient preference or you could substitute patient for clinician preference or just general stakeholder preference um, to be included in the um, methods themselves and the outcomes that we're gathering. Um, we can use these to provide transparency on any subjective recommendations about treatments that are being made. And we can also use them to provide consistency in the presentation of results about treatment. And then finally, we can use these to synthesize multiple outcomes into a single metric, if that's, if that's what we're looking to do in our research. So I just want to take a little bit of time to talk about the different perspectives of benefit risk. Um, so I mentioned that you could include patient preference. Um, and that could be any stakeholder. Um, but it's really important to be clear on whose perspective we're including when we are doing this in benefit risk research, because different stakeholders can have very different trade-offs and they can give different weightings to outcomes depending on their perspective. So we've got regulators, which we've spoken mostly about up until now. We've also got patients, clinicians, and then guidance makers. So by guidance makers, I'm, I'm thinking of NICE here, um, who decide what treatments could be used within the NHS. So just giving a brief overview of the perspectives in turn. Um, so the regulatory perspective, where we're considering generally one drug at a time um, to ensure the benefits outweigh the risks and they rely on good quality research often from RCTs or meta-analyses of RCTs to be able to do this and they're considering it at a group level so on average do the benefits of this drug outweigh the risks and many uh, regulatory organizations have guidance on how to do this so these are two examples from the FDA and the EMA um, and they have it as a requirement for gaining approval that you do this benefit risk assessment um, however, most of the recommendations um, are to use just frameworks and tables, so descriptive, and trying to clearly articulate the problem and the judgments that need to be made and all of the information that are going to go into making those judgments, but the judgments are still done subjectively. Now, this can create some potential issues. Um, as a paper um, by Hughes et al listed three key psychological considerations um, that could um, implement these decisions um, in these situations. So first of all, we've got anticipated regret where decision makers might avoid controversial decisions if they think they might be blamed. Um, the status quo bias where any treatments that are currently in practice are just considered acceptable and so their trade-off has is already been deemed to be normative um, in the eyes of the decision maker, even if they weren't the ones to have made that decision. And decision makers are significantly more risk averse than the patient population they represent. And this is very important if they're the ones making the decisions. So to avoid these potential um, biases, there is the potential to use quantitative benefit risk methods. And we in these may be able to include um, patient preferences themselves, which may avoid some of these issues. 
And very recently, um, the FDA published its first use of a quantitative method. Um, it was literally in August this year. Um, the paper's linked at the bottom. And this was the example that I gave in the introduction, um, where the main outcome was the reduction in cardiovascular death, and the main risk was um, the potential for the increase in bleeds. And this is from the paper where they used the quantitative methods that they are recommended that they could be used in specific circumstances where the balance of benefits and risks is marginal. And then these methods could be used to support the decision making. So here in the first table um, is the information that came from an RCT um, and it's about the incidence rate. Um, for the drug and placebo. So the drug is the, the first row and placebo is the second. Um, and it's for each of the outcomes that I mentioned before that were deemed important. In the second table, they then asked two different reviewers to weight the outcomes um, depending on importance. And as you can see, the weightings of the two are very different um, depending on the two um, reviewers. And then in the final table, they've taken these two values and combined them to create an overall benefit risk score for each outcome. And then they summed these benefit risk scores to get a total benefit risk score, which is in that first column of the, of the bottom table. And negative values indicate that um, the evidence favors placebo and positive values would favor the intervention. Now, if you remember from the introduction, I actually said that this drug was approved, yet these clearly have negative values, which suggest favoring a, a placebo in these cases when the benefit risk trade off was considered. And this was done because after this, these tables were created, um, an uncertainty analysis was completed and the range of benefit risk potential scores was very wide. And the regulators realized that this was due to the different perspectives and also the different patient characteristics and so ultimately they approved the drug so that clinicians and patients could decide based on their individual situations whether they felt like this drug would be beneficial so as we can see even when there are quantitative methods subjective opinions are still being used to make the final decisions um, but this was this plus the adversity analysis really helped to um, make this borderline decision And there I mentioned the patient perspective. So even though they want to know on average, does this drug work? What they really want to know is, is this drug going to work for me? And so there has been some work done in um, individualized patient um, benefit risk. So um, algorithms have been created where um, patient characteristics can be inserted and then the benefit risk trade-off for that particular person can be evaluated. And the idea is that these can be used in clinical practice to decide whether patients should be offered the treatment or not and it would be worthwhile for them. So these two graphics are taken from a paper by Urbanita um, and they have used this algorithm and created this graph and on the left that in the bluey grey um, suggests that there's a positive benefit risk balance and that in the orange suggests there's a negative benefit risk balance. And then what they did in this second image, which may be a little like to see, I've highlighted it in red, they took two example patients with different age um, and health characteristics and put them into the algorithm and decided patient one would have a positive benefit risk trade-off and patient two would have a negative, so they would not be offered the treatment. And so that brings on to, us on to clinician perspective, which we may think in many cases will be similar to um, the patient perspective, because even though they would like to know on a general basis, does this drug work? They also want to know for the patient in front of them, will this work? However, a lot of research has suggested that clinicians and patient preference is different within healthcare choices. And so I've just created this um, plot from a paper by Kennedy et al, who found that patients were willing to accept a lot a much larger change compared to clinicians in order to avoid surgery. So in the um, light yellow, we've got the baseline value for the two outcomes um, along the bottom, we've got local regrowth and survival. In the gray is what the patients will be willing to change that outcome to in order to avoid surgery. And um, 
the orange is what clinicians would be willing to change for the patient to avoid surgery. So taking survival as an example, um, 80% survival is the baseline. Patients were willing to reduce that to a 60% chance of survival in order to avoid surgery. But clinicians were only willing to accept a 5% reduction down to 75%. And this suggests that it's really important for clinicians and patients to be discussing because patients might be willing to accept a lot much larger difference on the outcome because they're obviously weighting having surgery much higher than a clinician would. And then finally, we've got the guidance maker's perspective. So as I said, I'm thinking about NICE here um, where they're comparing maybe two or more treatments um, to evaluate which would be the best in practice and to be rolled out within the NHS. So which has, after all have been given regulatory approval, which should be used within um, regular practice. And so here we might have additional considerations to that of the regulatory approval, where we might be looking at quality of life um, as well as costs, which are really important when we're thinking about the NHS. And so these items are often included within the health economic analysis of a trial. Um, but some of these benefit risk methods might be able to pull together both the, both the effectiveness analysis and the cost effectiveness analysis. And so for the rest of the project, I'm, the rest of this presentation, I'm going to be concentrating particularly on clinical trials and how we might be able to use these benefit risk methods in clinical trials specifically. Um, and to talk about this, um, we you completed the BRAINS project, um, which was funded by the MRC. And that consisted of four different steps. So we started with a survey on whether these methods were currently being used. We also did a rapid literature review to evaluate current methodologies and guidance that was out there. And these two things led into a two week workshop. Um, where we discussed around some of the issues and I'll present the results um, of what we found there. And then finally, we wrote a guidance document which will be out very soon. So um, I'll give links to where you'll be able to find that at the end. So from the literature review that we um, completed within that project, we found a lot of different methods. And so I just, I didn't want to go into too much detail here, but I do think it's useful to be able to provide some context about benefit risk because benefit risk is very broad and it's very much an umbrella term for a lot of different methods. So what we did from the literature review was um, to split the methods into six different categories um, and I won't go through, I've given examples of the methods underneath but I won't go into them in detail, they're just there for reference really. Um, but we're starting off with an overarching framework so they're generally you know a seven, eight, nine step process which starts with defining the problem, um, setting the context, selecting the important outcomes, all the way through to how the, de the decisions were made of the benefit risk trade off. Um, there's also summary tables, um, which are, as you would imagine, a summary of all the benefits and the risks, visualizations um, to aid understanding and interpretation. And you've got the quantitative trade off, where you're numerically um, trying to value things um, and be able to create a single metric at the end and um, preference and elicitation to be able to bring in that stakeholder preference um, and finally uncertainty estimation to be able to understand um, the range of potential values which we've seen in the earlier example was really important um, for the regulatory approval of, of that drug. And so just to provide you a couple of examples of these methods um, this is an example of um, a, a summary table, which is from the benefit risk action team, and it's called a key benefit risk table. Um, and as you can see at the top, you've got the benefits, which are clearly split from the risks. Um, each of the outcomes is clearly defined. And then the value for the intervention and the comparator, which was placebo in this case, um, are given, and then the risk difference to provide a comparable metric for each of those outcomes, along with a confidence interval to be able to evaluate the uncertainty. And then they've highlighted those to really clearly see which ones are better for the intervention and which ones are better for placebo. And you could 
do this same information um, through visualizations. So on the left, you've got a decision tree where you've again clearly split the benefits and risks and then given the outcomes as to, as to which we'll be um, explaining each of those um, important benefits and risks. And then on the right, there's a forest plot, which shows the outcomes that have been were shown in that previous table. And what this really does is not only shows the uncertainty um, through the size of the bar, but also the magnitude of each of the outcomes. So you can clearly see which ones are having the most impact for the patient. And there's an example of a quantitative trade-off. Um, so this is very similar to um, the example that I provided earlier with the three tables where there were the outcomes, the weightings, and then the final benefit risk score. This is just in a visual um, setting instead. And this is using MCDA, which is multi-criteria decision analysis. And this combines um, values from um, usually taken from RCTs and combines it with weightings, um, often given by patients, um, but it could be other stakeholders, and uses that to create a final benefit risk score. So here in the first column, we've got the weightings, and the second column, we've got the value, and the line down the middle is zero. So anything to the right favors the intervention, and anything to the left favors the um, control. And in this case, it was, again, it was placebo. Um, and so this is the difference between um, the intervention and control on each of those outcomes. And then the final column is the benefit risk score. So it's the combination of both the weight and the value. So you can see from the top row, um, relapse is having the most impact, is the largest benefit risk score. And that's mostly coming from the value column. So that's suggesting that the difference between the relapse outcome between intervention and control was large for relapse compared to many of the others. However, when you look at the weightings, it's actually the light blue um, PML, which has been weighted the highest by the patients. But due to the fact that there's basically no difference between the two groups on this, the impact that's having on the benefit risk score is very minimal. And then the final plot over on the right is called a waterfall plot. And so it starts, um, the green is every time there's a positive benefit risk um, score. And so it adds it on. And every time there's a negative, it takes it off and is in the red. And then the final bar at the bottom um, is the final benefit risk overall score. And as it's green and it's positive, we can see that, that this drug has, is deemed to have a positive benefit risk balance. So now that I've provided um, some examples of methods um, just to give a bit of context, um, in the BRAINS project, we looked at these methods and linked them to the rationales that I gave earlier. And so when you're looking at the overarching framework, what that really does is be able to provide consistency and transparency with the overall benefit risk process, um, which can be really important, especially when we're making subjective choices and decisions on treatment. The summary table again provides that um, transparency, consistency and between the trade-offs. Um, preference elicitation, it allows key stakeholders opinions and particularly patients to be systematically included. Um, the quantitative trade-offs allow the synthesis um, of multiple outcomes into comparable metrics. Um, again, in a consistent and transparent manner, and that can remove some of the subjectivity um, and some of those biases. The uncertainty estimation um, allows the uncertainty of the results to be really clear to the reader. And the visualizations can be used to aid understanding and interpretation. And what I've also included on this slide that we looked at in the project was, would this acquire additional data compared to what was already being collected in clinical trials? And in a lot of cases, um, the answer was no. So we can use the data we already have. We don't need to do anything different. We can just be providing the information in a different way to really increase that transparency and consistency. Um, however, some things such as preference elicitation, if you wanted to do that, you would need to include that within your project um, in addition. 
And so there are obviously lots of different methods and, and lots of different reasons to do them. And there isn't actually just one stage of a trial that you would consider that to use these. And um, so we also looked at the different um, stages of a trial. So at the trial design stage, you might use that summary table. And the idea of this would be to identify the key variables that you think will be the, the main benefits and risks within a trial. And then you can use available data in the literature to um, indicate why you believe this, this treatment may have a positive benefit risk balance. During the data collection, you may then do the preference solicitation um, on the key outcome variables. During analysis, you may then use these quantitative trade-offs, um, and this may be in addition to usual RCT analyses, um, and be able to include the weightings that have been gathered from the preference solicitation. Then your sensitivity analysis, you, you could be um, looking at the uncertainty estimation, and using this to identify the robustness of the results and particularly um, in terms of weighting. So you could use different stakeholder perspectives for the weightings or change the weighting slightly to see how robust your results are. And then finally, in the conclusions and dissemination, you can be using the summary tables and visualizations to really um, make any final conclusions that are made on the treatment um, really clear to the reader. And then finally, in the project, what we did was we thought about um, when you are reporting benefit risk work, what do we, what would we recommend that you include in those that reporting? So for we split it for, into applications and protocols and final results reports. Um, and we said we have recommended that there is a specific section for benefit risk and it uses that term benefit risk. Um, there's obviously a plan for the benefit risk assessment you're going to complete, as there would be in any protocol. And then you identify what the important um, anticipated benefits and risks are. And then really key is to discuss these with patients and the public to make sure that you haven't forgotten any important outcomes there. And then this is replicated mostly in the report, um, but in addition we recommend the use of a summary table in all cases um, just to include all of the applicable information in one place and then the potential to use quality adjusted life years <clears throat> which often as i mentioned are done in the health economic analysis and are already used um, within clinical trials but might be able to be reported um, in a different way and considered in a, in a benefit risk framework So after all of this work, um, many different future research ideas have come to the foreground. Um, one key thing that came from the work that we did is how do you select important outcome measures? So a lot I've spoken about in this presentation is um, including the important outcome measures and trading those off. So how, how do we know which ones to include and which ones not to? Secondly, um, more concrete guidance on how to implement the methods. There's a lot of methodological literature out there, so it'll be useful to pull these together. Um, and particularly my work going forward um, within my PhD will be focusing this on non-inferiority trials. Um, so this is where we have a new treatment and we generally want to show it's no worse than, so i.e. on non-inferior, to the current treatment on the main outcome. Um, but there's an understanding there that there is a benefit on another outcome. So this, even when I'm giving that example, suggests that there is multiple outcomes, at least two outcomes of interest here. And there may be a situation where we need to trade those off. And so these benefit risk methods could be implemented um, there to make this process more transparent and more streamlined. Also, some um, potential to look at the optimum methods for including patient preference. And then also, what are patients' opinions on, on us using these methods within research? Um, so some of these are ongoing and some of these are just ideas that, that may come through in the future. And in terms of resources, um, there is a lot of information online. Um, but we recently, myself and Professor Stephen Julius, set up a benefit risk group under the NIHR Statistics Group. And that is the web page where we collate um, relevant resources and try to just bring together researchers within the area to share their experience and best practice. Um, but we'll also be hosting events um, to try to discuss some of these issues and, and some short webinars. And the 
protect benefit risk web page is um, so our work very much has a focus on publicly funded trials and the protect benefit risk web page has um, more of a focus on regulatory um, drug decisions but they have a huge amount of um, information on there for the methods and examples and case studies so I really recommend going and looking on there um, it's a really great starting point for, for looking into benefit risk and then at the bottom I've put my email so I'm always welcome to hear of any questions or ideas or collaboration so please get in touch if you if you have anything at all thank you very much that's all from me okay thanks for that nikki um we already have our first question from uh, a name familiar to many uh, cindy <laughs> cooper cindy cooper says um preference solicitation seems to need expert input and resources are there preferences for specific interventions already available? Cindy, do you mean are there are there patient preferences for specific interventions? I.e., are there already is there already information out there? I'm going to assume that's what you mean. Um, so yes, yes, there will be a lot of work out there. So a lot of the health economists um, have done a lot of work in um, many of these different preference solicitations to decide um, which which treatments might be preferable whether they would be directly applicable to the RCT that you are doing I don't know they would definitely be able to um, give you the background probably to get started but I would maybe recommend that you would need to do a specific one unless there's one that's really aligned with what you're doing which might be unlikely i.e it's considered all the same outcomes that you are um i think it's possibly best to have it integrated within the trial so that it's all the same but the expert opinion and input is all very much available within SHAR. <laughs> Okay, thanks for that, Nikki. Um, we also have a question from Katie Miller who says, can these methods be translated for use in population-based cohort studies? Um, so yes, um, I very much focused on RCTs because that was um, the obviously my background and basis, but yes, these could be used in, in any studies really. And um, I think that there's obviously such a range of different um, methods that not all will be applicable. But yes, in a lot of cases, um, they actually, you know, when they're making regulatory decisions, they take information from a lot of different places. And sometimes that may be population based cohort studies. So, yes, they, that, that is very much possible. And okay. Cindy says, do I think HCA would fund it? <laughs> um, uh, good question. Potentially, yes. Um, I, I, I'm not 100 percent sure. It, it it depends a lot of a lot of the stuff could be done with stuff we already do so it, it's just taking the information therefore it doesn't cost any more you know it it can be done with the information we already collect which can be the real bonus um would i think there would need to be a reason a, a good reason to do it but i think if there was a good reason to do it i.e like the example i gave from FTA where it was a marginal decision and they felt like the quantitative analysis would help to aid their decision, then yes, I would hope they would fund it because it can support the final results, which is obviously very useful. Okay, thanks for that, Nikki. Right, do we have any more questions for Nikki? Either by switching on your mic or posting something in the chat? All gone quiet. <laughs> okay, I'll keep an eye on the chat for a moment just while I'm uh, finishing up. Um, so thanks for uh, joining us everyone today. Um, we do really appreciate you um, sparing your time to, to come along to these sessions. Um, as I say, or as I showed at the beginning, we've got a couple more coming up before the end of the year. Um, those uh, are bookable now and Andy put the links in the chat early on, I think. Um, so you should be able to uh, access those and um, uh, book on to, to our remaining sessions this year. 
Um, we do have a program going into 2022 as well. Um, there's a few more links on this slide um, about all of Charles Pike's graduate courses. Uh, and if you've got any questions about Charles' courses, that email address on the screen, char-pgt-inquiries at chef.ac.uk, is the one to, to send questions about any of our courses to, because they those inquiries will always find their way to the, the programme lead who will get back to you. And then just to remind you that uh, you can follow us on Twitter at Shah Sheffield and also uh, you can be our friend on Facebook. Um, we're keeping the, the Facebook page really, really up to date now. Um, Andy's kind of taken over the, the Shah Facebook page. So there's always new content on there, um, both about our courses and our students and about our research as well. So uh, give us a follow on both of those. Um, but thanks for joining us today. Uh, and we will, I think we will send around um, uh, uh, a link to the recording and the, the slides after the session. Okay, but thanks for joining us, everyone.